throughout all the complexities and the training from human databases of Go games and built a new system, AlphaGo Zero, that trained itself from scratch. No looking at the human playbooks, no special purpose code, just a general purpose game player being specialized to Go, more or less. And uh, three days, there's a, there's a quote from Gwern about this, which I forget exactly, but it was something like, we know how long AlphaGo Zero or, or Alpha Zero, two different systems, what was equivalent to a, to a human Go player. And it was like 30 minutes on the following floor of, of uh, this such and such deep mind building. And maybe the first system isn't doesn't improve that quickly and they build another system that does and and all of that with AlphaGo over the course of years going from like it takes a long time to train to it trains very quickly and without looking at the human playbook like that's not with an artificial intelligence system that improves itself or or even that sort of like gets smarter as you run it the way that human beings not just as you evolve them but as you run them over the course of their own lifetimes improve so if the first system doesn't improve fast enough to kill everyone very quickly they will build one that's meant to spit out more gold than that and there could be weird things that happen before the end i did not see chat gpt coming i did not see stable diffusion coming i did not expect that we would have ais smoking humans in rap battles before the end of the world it's kind well, of they were clearly much dumber than us. Kind of a nice send off, I guess, in some ways. I so you said that you have uh, y your hope is not zero, and you are planning to fight to the end. What does that look like for you? I I know um, you're working at MIRI, which is uh, the Mean uh, Machine Intelligence Research Institute. Uh, this is a nonprofit that I believe that you sort of set up to work on this AI alignment and safety sort of issues. What are you doing there? What are you spending your time on? What do you think, like, how do we actually fight until the end? If, if you do think that an end is coming, how do we try to resist? I'm actually on something of a sabbatical right now because we have... Well, I'm on something of a sabbatical right now, which is why I have time for podcasts. Um, it's a sabbatical from, you know, like been doing this 20 years. It became clear we were all going to die. I felt kind of burned out, taking some time to rest at the moment. When I dive back into the pool, um, I don't know, maybe I will go off to conjecture or anthropic or one of the smaller concerns like Redwood Research, Redwood Research being the only ones I really trust at this point, but they're, but they're, they're tiny. Um, and try to figure out if I can see anything clever to do with the giant inscrutable matrices of floating point numbers. Um, maybe I just write, continue to try to explain in advance to people why this problem is hard instead of as easy and cheerful as the current people who think they're pessimists think it will be. I might not be working all that hard compared to how I used to work. My, I'm, I'm older than I was. My body is not in the greatest of health these days. Um, going down fighting doesn't necessarily imply that I have the stamina to fight all that hard. What it's, would... uh, I, I wish I had prettier things to say to you here, but, but I do not. No, this um, is, this is uh, uh, you know, we intended to save probably the, the last part of this, this episode to talk about some crypto, the metaverse, and AI and how this all intersects. But um, I got to say, at this point in the episode, it all kind of feels pointless to go down that mm. uh, track record. I, I, we were going to ask questions like, well, um, in crypto, should we be worried about building sort of a property rights system, an economic system, a programmable money system for the AIs to sort of use against us later on? But it sounds like uh, the easy answer from you to those questions would be, yeah, absolutely. And by the way, none of that matters regardless. Uh, you could do whatever you'd like with crypto. This is going to be the inevitable outcome uh, no matter what. 
Let me ask you, what would you say to somebody listening who maybe has been sobered up by this conversation, is a uh, version of you in your 20s, does have the stamina to continue this battle and to actually fight on behalf of humanity against this existential threat, um, where would you advise them to spend their time? Is this a technical issue? Is this a social issue? Is it a combination of both? Should they educate? Should they spend time in the lab? Like, what should a person listening to this episode do with these types of dire straits? I don't have really good answers. It depends on what your talents are. If you've, if you've got the very deep version of the security mindset, the part, the part where you don't just put a, you know, like put a password on your system so that nobody can walk in and, and directly misuse it, but the kind where you, where the kind where you don't just encrypt the password file, even though nobody's supposed to have access to the password file in the first place and was already an authorized user, but the part where you hash the, the passwords and salt the hashes, you know, if, if you can think, if, if, if you're the kind of person who can think of that from scratch, maybe take your hand at alignment. If you can think of an alternative to the giant inscrutable matrices, then, you know, don't, don't tell the world about that. Um, I'm not quite <laughs> sure where you go from there, but, you know, maybe you work with Redwood Research or something. Um, a whole lot of this problem is, is that even if you do build an AI that's limited in some way, you know, somebody else steals it, copies it, runs it themselves, and takes the bounds off the for loops and the world ends. So, you know, there's, yeah, but, so there's, there's that, there's, you can do, you think you can do something clever with the giant inscrutable matrices, you're probably wrong. If you have the talent to try to figure out why you're wrong in advance of being hit over the head with it and not in a way where you just like make random far-fetched stuff up as the reason why it won't work but where you can actually like keep looking for the reason why it won't work um we have people in crypto who are good at breaking things and they're the reason why anything is not on fire and some of them might go into breaking ai systems instead because that's where you learn anything you know, it, it, you know, not, any fool can build a crypto system that they think will work. Breaking existing crypto systems, crypto cryptographical systems, is how we learn who the real experts are. So maybe the people finding weird stuff to do with AIs, maybe those people will will come up with some truth about these systems that that makes them easier to align than I suspect. There's out. They're the, the outfits that are, how do I put it? The, 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 the saner outfits do have uses for money. They don't really have scalable uses for money, but they do burn any money literally at all. Like if you gave Miri a billion dollars, I would not know how to, I, I well, I, I might, at a billion dollars, I might like try to, bribe people to move out of AI development that gets broadcast to the whole world and, and move to the equivalent of an island somewhere, not even to make any kind of critical discovery, but, you know, just to remove them from the system if I had a billion dollars. Um, if I just have another $50 million, I'm not quite sure what to do with that. But, you know, if you donate that to, to Miri, then you at least have the assurance that we will not randomly spray money on looking like we're doing stuff and we'll reserve it as we are doing with the last giant crypto donation somebody gave us until we can figure out something to do with it that is actually helpful and miri has that property probably red i would say probably redwood research has that property um yeah there's i i realize i'm sounding sort of disorganized here and that's because i don't really have a good organized answer to you know, how in general somebody goes down fighting with dignity. I know um, a lot of people in crypto, um, they are not as in touch with 
artificial intelligence, obviously, as you are, and the AI safety issues and um, the existential threat that you've presented in this episode, they do care a lot and see um, coordination problems throughout society as an issue. Um, many have also uh, generated wealth from crypto and uh, care very much about humanity not ending. Um, what sort of things has Miri, that, it, that is the organization I was talking about, MIRI, um, earlier, what sort of things have you done with funds that you've received from crypto donors and, and elsewhere? And what sort of things might an organization like that pursue to try to stave this off? I mean, I think mostly we've pursued a lot of lines of research that haven't really panned out, which is a respectable thing to do. We did not know in advance that those lines of research would fail to pan out. If you're doing research that you know will work, you're probably not really doing any research. You're just like do, doing a pretense of research that you can show off to a funding agency. We tried to be real. We did things where we didn't know the answer in advance. They didn't work, but that was where the hope lay, I think. Um... But, you know, that's, but, you know, having a, having a research orga organization that keeps it real that way, that's not an easy thing to do. And if you don't have this very deep form of the security mindset, you will end up producing fake research and doing more harm than good. So I would not tell all the successful crypto people to, uh, cryptocurrency people to um, run off and start their own research outfits. Redwood Research. I'm not sure if they can scale using more money, but you know you can give people more money and wait for them to figure out how to scale it later. If the kind, if they're the kind who won't just run off and spend it, which is what Miri aspires to be. Um, and you don't think the education path is um, a useful path? Just educating the world. Um, getting. I mean, I, I would, I would give myself and Miri credit for for why the world isn't just walking blindly into the ra whirling razor blades here, but. It's not clear to me how far education scales apart from that. You can you can get more people aware that we're walking directly into the whirling razor blades, because even if only 10% of the people can get it, that can still be a bunch of people. But then what do they do? I don't know. Maybe they'll be able to do something later. Can you get all the people? Can you get all the politicians? Can you get the people whose job incentives are against them admitting this to be a problem. I have various friends who report like, ah, oh, yes, if you talk to researchers at OpenAI in private, they're very worried and say that they like cannot be that worried in public. Um, this is uh, all a giant Moloch trap is is sort of what you're telling us. I um, I feel like this is the part of the conversation where we've gotten to the end and the, and the doctor has just um, said that we have some sort of terminal illness. And, you know, at the end of the conversation, I think, you know, the patient, David and I have to ask the question, okay, doc, how long do we have? Um, like, seriously, what, what are we talking about here? If you turn out to be correct, are we talking about years? Are we talking about decades? Like, what, uh, what's your idea here? If, what are you preparing yeah. for? Yeah. How the hell would I know? Enrico <laughs> Fermi was saying that nuclear, that like, fission chain reactions were 50 years off if they could ever be done at all, two years before he built the first nuclear pile. The Wright brothers were saying heavier than air flight was 50 years off, shortly before they built the first Wright flyer. How, how, would, how, how on earth would I know? It could be three years, it could be 15 years. We could get that, that AI winter I was hoping for, and it could be 16 years. I, I'm not really seeing 50 without some kind of giant civilizational catastrophe. And to be clear, whatever civilization arises after that could, you know, would probably, I'm guessing, end up in, stuck in just the same trap we are. I uh, think the other thing that the patient might do at the end of a conversation like this is um, also consult with other doctors. Um, I'm kind of curious if, you know, who we should talk to on this, on this quest. Um, who are some people that if people in crypto want to hear more about this or learn more about this, or even we ourselves as, as podcasters and educators want to pursue this topic, who are the other individuals in the AI alignment and safety space you might recommend 
uh, for us to have a conversation with? Well, the person who actually holds a coherent technical view who disagrees with me is named Paul Cristiano. He is, he does not write Harry Potter fan fiction and I expect to have a harder time explaining himself in concrete terms. Um, but that is like the, the, the main technical voice of opposition. If you talk to other people in the effective altruism or AI alignment communities who um, disagree with this view, they are probably to some extent repeating back their misunderstandings of Paul Cristiano's <laughs> views. Um, you could try Ajaya Kotro, who's worked pretty directly with Paul Cristiano, and I think sometimes expires, uh, aspires to as explain these things um, that, that Paul is not the best at explaining. Um, I'll throw out Kelsey Piper as somebody who um, would be good at explaining, like would not claim to be a, a, a like a technical person on these issues, but would but is like good at explaining the part that she does know. Um, and who else uh, that disagrees with me? You know, I'm sure Robin Hansen would be happy to come up. Well, well I'm, not, I'm sure, not sure he'd be happy to come on this podcast, but you know, Robin Hansen disagrees with me, and I kind of feel like the the famous argument we had back in the to, like early 2010s, late 2000s about how this would all play out. I basically feel like this was the Yudkowsky position, this is the Hansen position, and then reality was over here, like to the well to the Yudkowsky side of the of the Yudkowsky position in the, in the Yudkowsky Hansen debate. But Robin Hansen does not feel that way. <laughs> I would probably be happy to expound on that at length. Um, I don't know. It's yeah, it's not hard to find opposing viewpoints. Um, the the ones that'll that'll stand up to. Uh, a few solid minutes of cross-examination from somebody who knows which parts to cross-examine. That's the hard part. You know, I've read a lot of your uh, writings and um, listened to you on previous podcasts. One was in 2018 um, on the Sam Harris podcast. This conversation feels to me like the most dire uh, you've ever seemed on this topic. And maybe that's not true. Maybe you've, you've sort of always been this way, but... Um, it seems like the direction of your hope that we solve this issue has declined. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if you feel like that's the case and if you could sort of summarize your, your take on all of this as we close out this episode and offer, I guess, any thoughts, uh, concluding thoughts here. I mean, uh, so well, I don't know if you've got like a time limit on this episode, question mark? Or is it just as long as it runs? It's as long as it needs to be. And I feel like this is a pretty important topic. So you answer this mm. and All right. however you want. Well, there was a conference one time on what are we going to do about looming risk of AI disaster? And Elon Musk attended that conference. And I was like, maybe this is it. Maybe, you know that maybe this is when the the powerful people notice and it's you know like one of the relatively more technical powerful people who could be noticing this and maybe this is where humanity finally turns and starts you know not quite fighting back because there isn't an external enemy here but conducting itself with uh i don't know acting like it cares maybe and what came out of that conference, well, was OpenAI, which was basically the very nearly the worst possible way of doing anything. Uh, a whole like this is not a problem of oh no, what if secret elites get AI? It's that nobody knows how to build the thing. If if we do have an alignment technique, it's going to involve running the AI with a bunch of like careful bounds on it, where you don't just like throw all the cognitive power you have at something, you have limits on the for loops. And whatever whatever it is that, that could possibly save the world, like turn all go out and turn all the GPUs and the server clusters into Rubik's Cubes, or something else that prevents the world from ending when somebody else builds another AI a few weeks later, you know, 
Anything that could do that is, is an artifact where somebody else could take it and take the bounds off the for loops and use it to destroy the world. Yeah, so, like, let's open up everything. Let's accelerate everything. It's It was it was like GPT-3's version, though GPT-3 didn't exist back then, but it was like ChatGPT's blind version of, like, throwing the ideals at a place where they were exactly the wrong ideals to solve the problem. And the problem is that demon summoning is easy and angel summoning is much harder. Open sourcing all the demon summoning circles is not the correct solution. Not even using, and I'm using Elon Musk's own terminology here. They talk about AI is summoning the demon, which, you know, not accurate, but, and then the solution was to put a demon summoning circle in every household. And why? Because his friends were calling him Luddites once he'd expressed any concern about AI at all. So he picked a road that sounded like openness and set, and like, and like accelerating technology. So his friends would stop calling him Luddites. It was very much the worst, you know, like maybe not the literal actual worst possible strategy, but so very far pessimal. And, and that was it. That was like, that, that was me in 2015 going like, oh, so, so this is what humanity will elect to do. We, we, we will not rise above. We will not have more grace, not even here at the very end. So that is, you know, that, that is, uh, that is when I did my crying late at night and then picked myself up and fought and fought and fought until I'd run out all the avenues that 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 I seem to have the capabilities to, to do. There's like more things, but they require scaling my efforts in a way that I've never been able to make them scale. And and they're and all of it's pretty far fetched at this point, anyways. So, you know that that so, what's you know what's changed over the years? Well, first of all, I ran out some remaining avenues of hope, and second, things got to be such a disaster, such a visible disaster. The AIs got powerful enough, and it became clear enough that you know we did not know how to align these things that I could actually say what I've been thinking for a while and not just have people go completely like, what are you saying about all this? <laughs> you know, now, now the stuff that was, that was obvious back in 2015 is, you know, starting to become visible and distance to others and not just like completely invisible. That's what changed over time. What kind of, um, what do you hope people hear out of, this episode and out of out of your comments, Eliezer in, in 2023, who is sort of running on the last fumes of of hope. Um, yeah, what do you what do you want people to get out of this episode? What, like, what are you planning to do? I I don't have concrete hopes here. You know, when everything is in ruins, you might as well speak the truth, right? Maybe somebody. Here is that somebody figures out something I didn't think of. I mostly expect that this does more harm than good in the modal universe, because a bunch of people are like, oh, I have this brilliant clever idea, which is, you know, like something that somebody that, you know, I was arguing against in 2003 or whatever. But, you know, maybe, maybe there, maybe somebody out there with the proper level of pessimism hears and thinks of something I didn't think of. I, I suspect that if there's hope at all, it comes from a technical solution because the difference between technical solutions, technical problems and political problems is at least the technical problems have solutions in principle. <laughs> at least the technical problems are solvable. We're not on course to solve this one, but I don't really see the... I, I think anybody who's hoping for a political solution has frankly not understood the technical problem. They do not understand what it looks like to, to try to solve the political problem to such a degree that the world is not controlled by AI because they don't understand how easy it is to destroy the world with AI given that the clock keeps ticking forward. They're thinking that they just have to solve, stop some bad actor, and that's why they think there's a political problem or a political, political solution. But yeah, I don't have concrete hopes. I didn't come on this episode out of any concrete hope. I, I have no takeaways except like, don't make this thing worse. Don't, don't, don't like go off and accelerate AI more. Don't, um, don't, don't, 
if you have a brilliant solution to alignment, don't be like, ah, yes, I have solved the whole problem. We just use the following clever trick. Don't, you know, don't make things worse than very much of a message, especially when you're pointing people at the field at all. But there aren't, I have no winning strategy. Might as well go on this podcast and say what I, th as an experiment and say what I think and, and see what happens. And probably no good ever comes of it. But, you know, there, you, you might as well go down fighting, right? You, if, they, if there's a world that survives, maybe it's a world that survives because of a bright idea somebody had after listening to, listening to this podcast. That was brighter, to be clear, than the usual run of bright ideas that don't work. <laughs> Eliezer, um, I want to thank you for, for coming on um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and talking to us today. I, I do, I don't know if, by the way, you've seen that movie that David was referencing earlier, the movie Don't Look Up, but I sort of feel like that, uh, that news anchor who's talking to like, the scientist, is it Leonardo DiCaprio, David? And uh, the scientist yeah, is yeah, talking yeah. about kind of dire straits of the world. And... Um, I've, the news anchor just really just doesn't know what to do. I, I'm almost at a loss for words uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. I, um, but what yeah, one thing I've, I've had nothing for a while. One thing now. I can say <laughs> is um, I appreciate your honesty. Um, I appreciate that you've uh, given this a lot of time and given this a lot of thought. Everyone, anyone who has heard you speak or uh, read anything you've written knows that um, you care deeply about this issue and uh, have given it a tre tremendous amount of your life force. Uh, in trying to you know educate people about it, and um, thanks for taking the time to do that again today. I'll uh, I guess I'll just let the the audience digest this episode in the best way they know how. Um, but um, I want to reflect everybody in crypto and everybody listening to Bankless uh, their thanks for you coming on and, and explaining. Thanks for having me. Um, we'll see what comes of it. Action items for you, Bankless Nation. We always end with some action items. Not really sure where to refer folks to today, but one thing I know we can refer folks to is uh, MIRI, which is the M Machine Research Intelligence Institution that Eliezer has uh, been talking about through this episode. That is at intelligence.org, I believe. Uh, and um, I, you know, some people in crypto have donated uh, funds to this in the past. Vitalik Buterin is is one of them. You can take a look at what they're doing as well. That might be an action item for the end of this episode. Um, Got to end with risks and disclaimers. Man, this seems very trite, but um, our, our legal experts have asked us to say these at the end of every episode. Crypto is risky. You could lose everything. You Apparently not in. as risky as AI, yeah. though. Um, <laughs> but we're headed west. This is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we're glad you're with us on the bankless journey. Thanks a lot. And, and, and we are grateful for the crypto community's support. Like, it was possible to end with even less grace than this. Wow. And <laughs> you made a difference. <laughs> we appreciate you. You really made a difference. Thank you.
Middle tower has fallen. I reach it. Your top tower is under attack. Your top tower is under attack. Your middle tower is under attack. Your middle tower is dead. Oh, regret that. How many daggers am I holding up? <laughs> Assassination is nature's way. Middle yeah. tower has fallen.
top tower has fallen. Souls beckon. Your top tower is under attack. Radiant structures are fortified. The enemy's bottom tower has fallen.
Middle Tower has fallen. Regeneration. This should make my life easier. Sean has fallen to the dark. Immortality! Bottom tower has fallen. I'm under attack! Let me get my arrows back, and then you can die. The enemy's bottom tower has fallen. Dire structures are fortified. Your top tower is under attack.
one down. Four to go. Out of the vein. to be seen. <laughs> my blood on your hands. As ever. Your middle barracks are under I am attack back with new victims in mind.
that king's pushing? Is, is that my blood coming out? <laughs> Dyer's courier has been killed. The enemy's bottom barracks has fallen. The enemy's bottom barracks has fallen. Dyer's structures are fortified. The enemy's middle tower has fallen. The enemy's top barracks has fallen. The enemy's top barracks has fallen. You now have mega creeps. Mm -hmm. 